thank you for all for being here and participating. Um, let me start with you, Ben. So um, you obviously made incredible strides in increasing transparency at the Fed. So I'm going to ask you sort of three questions. What were you most trying to accomplish? How successful do you think you were? And where have you been the most frustrated? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> I, I think that if I try to answer that in detail, it would take the whole panel. I don't want to do that. Um, I think there's no number of reasons for transparency. One is just this idea that, that John raised, which is trying to explain the likely course of policy as a way of making it more effective. Um, and in particular, I think people should remember that a lot of this was done during a zero lower bound period when the usual Taylor Rule type you know, principles didn't apply because of the constraint, and we did have to communicate more than normally. I mean, I think that one could argue that having a, a, an inflation target and a forecast in normal times might be enough. But under the circumstances we were under, we were trying to explain, um, you know, not only uh, sort of the, where we ultimately wanted to go, but something about where policy would have to evolve in order to meet, meet, those, meet those targets. Um, but also, uh, as has also been indicated, this was a period of, of tremendous political reaction and upheaval. And I think the Fed... Uh, has made an effort. I mean, obviously, we haven't, we, I can't say we anymore, but the Fed has not completely succeeded, but it was important to explain to the broader public about what we were doing, why we were, you know, why we were doing it. And I think in this respect, the, to, to, to help the res, much maligned Reserve Bank presidents here, who, who I want to emphasize the chair is not able to coordinate or muzzle and doesn't try to coordinate or muzzle the Reserve Bank president commentary, but to, in, in their support, they were an important uh, basis for uh, providing political support for the Fed in that they would go out in Indianapolis or San Diego, wherever it was, explain what the Fed was doing and talk to local leaders, community business leaders and the like, and kind of bring them along. And so I think if I could just make one reaction to this whole, this whole conference is that there's too much emphasis here on, on financial market people wanting to know what, is, what are interest rates going to do in 2017? Mm -hmm. Nobody knows, mm -hmm. all right? The economy is too uncertain, and moreover, it's a dynamic decision process with 19 people involved, so that even if you sort of thought, you know, privately where you thought things were going to go, you have to recognize that there's got to be a dynamic debate going on and new information has to be in. So anyway, so you can try to indicate the direction of policy, and that's, again, was something that was important to do, particularly during the zero lower bound period, but it's also important to serve these other functions in terms of education. I liked uh, uh, Jared's comment about uh, Lael Brainerd. She brought it, she was bringing the debate about uh, policy to a broader public and encouraging input to that debate and, and making it in more depth and in more public way than she could presumably around the FOMC table where she gets the three, four minutes that she gets. So anyway, so I, I think that uh, it, it's important to, to recognize that this communication has a wider range of functions. Was everything equally successful? I, I think you could also retitle this conference, Why We Don't Like the Dot Plot. <laughs> okay. we'll you don't that. Like, I think that the dot plot is like the advanced level of the, of the video game, okay? If you haven't been to the first 12 levels, forget about the dot plot. But if you, if you are sophisticated, you should, those of you here who are Fed watchers, if you understand the dot plot, give yourself full credit you should definitely, I mean, I, I personally, I wrote a post yesterday, as, as, as John mentioned, where I argued that there is useful information there, that the difficulties of aggregating the dots are the same difficulties that the Fed itself faces when it tries to aggregate all these views internally. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so I think, I think I'm generally, overall, and finish this long question, uh, I, I'm generally pleased. I think we've made a lot of progress. I think the press conferences have, have been a big success. Um, I think generally that communication is much better, but I, I do think people should be realistic in terms of what they can expect in terms of prediction of, of future interest rates. So in our survey that we sent out, uh, as David mentioned, the academics gave the Fed a pretty good grade, um, and the markets gave it a much less um, good grade in saying they had a lot of trouble understanding what it was trying to communicate. So both of you have sort of a different role. Let me start with Elon. So you have a role as part of the press. So what is your perspective on how well, how easy it's been to understand the Fed and how difficult, you know, what, what, your, what grade would you give Fed communications? 
Uh, well, I'm going to shy away from giving an actual grade for knowing what the curve <laughs> is on the yeah. grading scale. Um, but what I would say is that the press has a very different role. I mean, uh, Ben, I think you made a good point in that the markets are not the only audience that the Fed has. Um, the press's role, um, I think, is to not just divine what the Fed is trying to say and sort of explain what the Fed is doing, but also to hold the Fed accountable. Um, you know, oftentimes I feel that Fed reporting is likened to Supreme Court reporting, right? The person who wins, the person who gets the scoop, is the person who uh, correctly identifies what the Fed might do or correctly identifies what word might change in the FOMC statement going forward. But, I don't, but that's sort of the role of the professional Fed watchers as well. And I think that the role of the press needs to be one that has, uh, that's, that's more focused on accountability. So, for example, just to call you out on, on one thing, you know, we sort of talked about the example of, uh, of the taper tantrum in 2013, you know, when you sort of laid out, here are the conditions that we might expect to see when the taper finally ends, and you brought up the unemployment rate being 7%. Um, you know, I, I really felt that both myself and my colleagues you know, didn't do enough to say, you said 7%, you guys had this forecast of where the unemployment rate was headed, it was wrong, why is that? You know, what did that mean for, for how you were going to conduct policy in the future? What did that mean for, uh, for, for the Fed's reaction function? So I feel that um, you know, we should be backward looking more so than we should be forward looking, um, or just as much as we should be forward looking, because I feel the, the press has, has a role of um, holding the Fed accountable in a way that uh, the markets don't. We're not trying to explain away what the Fed is doing. We're trying to understand and 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 call it out when there are changes in in uh, changes in in forecasts or in thought. Do you think that the changes that <clears throat> Ben made um, in transparency have actually helped in, in terms of improving accountability? I mean, is that, are, are those are things you'd say like that was the right step? Step. You know, I, I think you know? that the press conferences are really I I find them helpful both from my own understanding and I hope that the public finds them helpful as well. I think that. Um, with the press, you're going to have uh, different types of questions be asked than you would um, for market participants. Um, I think that the press has shown that it's uh, pretty good at trying to um, pin down information from uh, members of the FOMC and from participants um, in the FOMC meetings. You know, in the um, I believe in the paper that John presented, you know, he has an anecdote about Alan, Alan Greenspan, you know, sort of saying, well, don't talk to the press because you give them one straw, they'll try to make a story out. If you give them two straws, they'll make up a big headline about it, right? I think that goes to show that maybe the Fed is, does serve a useful role um, and that the press can be uh, a valuable tool in helping to understand and explain what the Fed is doing. So, Tim, um, explain to me what you think of as your audience and your role in this. And so when I'm going to ask you how you grade them, but I want to say, so from what perspective would you even be taking? Because I'm not really so sure. I end up <laughs> taking, a, I think, a number of different perspectives. Sometimes it's more of a, as an academic, and sometimes it's more as a market participant or somebody speaking toward market participants. So I cross, I think, a lot of the different um, boundaries. Uh, so and what I've noticed is, yes, the, as Alan said, you, the market participants are going to want far more certainty than the Fed is ever possibly able to give. In some sense, they were getting spoiled during the, the crisis because we could lay down, oh, we're going to hold interest rates zero for an extended period of time. And we really can't uh, do that anymore. And so anytime we lay down specific markers, which academics might like because it gives some guidelines by which we can, we can analyze it, mm -hmm it becomes too much for the markets. They, they lock onto those, those specific guidelines, and it becomes a real, um, uh, a, a real mark that they can follow. So, um, so, so that's, I think, certainly that issue makes it why academics might grade the Fed higher, because they're happy to see that transparency, and they can interpret that transparency better. Um, but the financial markets don't you know, appreciate it unless it's very, very much uh, um, uh, you know, an accurate statement. So that actually, I have a question for you, Ben. So, sort of related to what um, the, the different access that you have. So uh, the chair meets with the press before the week before the FOMC meeting. Um, and we've heard people tell us that, you know, one of the problems is, is that market participants can't meet directly with the chair, um, that it would be viewed as sort of, you know, giving um, favoritism, but that maybe there's just not enough communication. So that some of these communication person problems with the market is just because there's just not enough dialogue, you know. Do you think that the Fed gets the markets? Do you think that it needs more input? And, and is that that's something that sort of, sort of just well, there is there is a problem there, which is um, 
uh, when you meet with press or you meet with, um, I don't know, bank CEOs or you meet with market participants or whatever, I mean, you, you need to do some of that as a member of the board because you want to get the input, you want to understand what's happening in markets, but there's always the, even if you don't say anything that you shouldn't say, there's always the risk that the person will go out and say, well, I met with the chair, and of course, here's my inside view, and, uh, and that's illegitimate. You know, you don't want that to happen. So um, uh, I, I think that is a problem, and, and I, you know, I personally gain to rely a lot on, on trusted members, you know, people on the board, for example, who had their ear to the ground or to the New York Fed and so on. It is a problem. It is a problem because you don't want to, you know, there are a few groups. There's, for example, um, the Treasury Borrowing Advisory Committee, which is made up of people from all around the financial industry, uh, which has a formal role in advising the Treasury on its, on its debt issuance. And they would come regularly, you know, and, and, and explain, you know, there would be a broad discussion of developments in markets. There is a, a Federal Advisory Council, which is created by the Federal Reserve Act, which is a, a banker from each of the 12 districts. And so you would get, you know, some formalized input, but, but trying to manage that communication in a way that didn't violate, you know, confidentiality, et cetera, is, is not easy. And so, Elon, do you view that as one of your roles to also not just hold them accountable, but, but be that intermediary between the markets and the Fed? Or is that not really something the press sort of um, can I do? I don't really consider the markets <laughs> when I'm writing markets. my stories. Yeah. No, I don't. Um, but one thing I would say, um, also in defense of the much maligned Fed presidents in this uh, conference so far, is that um, they also serve an important role for sort of generating new ideas. I mean, sort of, they are the ones who can throw the spaghetti against the wall, right, and not have not have so much weight attached to um, their words, and so they feel a little bit less constrained. You know, you have to remember it was uh, James Bullard who came up with the idea for, who was promoting the idea of an open-ended QE very early on, um, Charlie Evans and the thresholds, right? Um, so I think that, you know, even though at the time that they are perhaps making those arguments, those are, they are not setting the course of policy over time, some of those ideas can be assimilated into um, the consensus and they can be very important. So I, don't, so I think that that's another reason why it's really important for, um, I, I, why well, I don't consider much of what the Fed presidents say to be noise. I think that um, you can, I think it's important to mine all of the information thoroughly. The market participants should pay attention to the chair if they're trying to figure out what's going on, but the press should pay attention to everything um, to look for sort of underlying stories that may or may not go someplace. I think that's uh, right. You know, one of, the, one of the points we haven't talked about is we do um, a, a press conference every other meeting. Mm -hmm. And a press conference at every meeting, I think, would help to resolve some of these issues. For example, Alan had the extended um, uh, uh, version of the FOMC statement, and some of that could be, in fact, incorporated more in the um, press conference, and if we're all complaining that we don't get enough talk from the chair, there is an opportunity for four more times a year. That seems pretty straightforward. Can I comment? Yes, First please of all, do. I, I, I should agree like with to you principle. <laughs> Just have a little bit of sympathy for having to be the chair and having to run that, <laughs> right. that meeting and, <laughs> and having to explain, you know, and do, doing all the stuff which now the chair does. The chair now summarizes the content of the meeting and, mm -hmm. and does a lot more internally than used to do. And then you got to go out and do the press conference. It's not... It's not the most easy thing, but I, I you know, I, I understand, understand your argument. I, I, I liked Alan's revision of the statement, but there's another practical issue, two points. One is that the statement has to come out immediately after the end of the meeting, and so there is a sense in which you would have to do a lot of this work in advance of the meeting, and to what extent is it therefore really reflective necessarily of, the, of new debates going on. And, and then the other point was that you, 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 when you wrote that statement, obviously you understood these, the debates um, so clearly the minutes and the speeches and all the other communications had clearly explained to you what the, what the issues were. I, I, I somehow don't think that if that statement was, was the official statement, you, you would have been particularly better informed about the debate than you are but he's uh, on now. level 12 of the video game. He's level so. 12, I understand sure that. that. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> which is... Yeah, could be, could be. The battling it. So the, can I ask a question, yeah. though, which is, why is, why in the revised statement would not including the fact that there was election risk and election uncertainty in November be too much transparency? Why would including that information either in the statement or in the, um, in the press conference following be considered too much transparency? Well, you're looking at me. I don't know. I wasn't, <laughs> I, 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 I'm not at all sure. I'm not at all sure. I mean, the, the other aspect of November was there was no press conference at that meeting. Right. 
So I, whether the election was, was an important issue or not, I, I honestly don't know whether it was. Well, I, I, would say I, was, I was frustrated um, by, that, uh, by the September meeting and by the, uh, by the November statement in that, you know, the, I feel that the Fed is so careful to preserve its independence, which is a, a, an important and useful thing, that they are afraid to say what was obvious to everyone, which is that there was huge uncertainty around this election. And I think that, the, um, that that contributes to the confusion in the marketplace because they're looking at, looking at the economic data, and the economic data is pretty good. There's no real reason why you couldn't go in November except for these two reasons we just brought up, which was the election and which was there's no press conference. But if those are the reasons that you're not going, they're not very clear from the statement, and they're not really economic reasons. So I think that the Fed should be um, more, uh, I think the Fed could be more transparent or more straightforward in, um, in admitting some of those things. And that's another yeah. reason for another issue of the press conference or lack thereof. It did, yeah, it, and, and I appreciate your, your concerns um, as well, but the, the, the issue of not having a press conference and therefore not being able to do policy we know we can do policy, but somehow they've chosen not to on, on a lot of occasions, especially when you're only going to raise interest rates once a year. It doesn't seem like there's any reason not to do it, you know, unless there's a press conference. But, but that is challenging. And, and the other thing on the political issue that was challenging is that it was clear that uh, Brexit had an impact, and that was stated. And so it, it's not clear that why Brexit should have some kind of impact, uh, but the U.S. election shouldn't uh, would be a, another issue. So when I'm reading for both of these comments, I think um, – which is that whenever there's something that's kind of obvious but it's not said, it kind of, the Fed sort of loses a little credibility when people are all wondering, oh boy, are they really thinking this but they're not telling us? Like I've seen some of your blogs where like, you know, people trying to pretend that, that the November meeting is live, you know, as if, you know, people don't realize that probably they're not going to move but they're only going to move one time. Um, and I'm wondering if, if that was a problem with going to just the four press conferences, which is sort of now we have two kinds of meetings. One that's less likely, um, and whether or not that's an issue, that somehow you've almost moved monetary policy so you're only making four decisions a year or something. Um, I don't know if you think that that's Well, I think issue. there's two states of the world. One is the one we're in now where rate increases are extremely rare, where rate changes are extremely rare, and the actual precise timing of November versus December makes almost no difference, yeah. in which case there's not a whole lot of loss you know, to doing, having four effective meetings a year. Or there's a more alternative situation where rates are moving more quickly, in which case I think you'll see that the Fed would be willing to move off in meetings without a press conference. Mm -hmm. It was just yeah. one more yeah. issue that, that you, about the presidents that yeah. had been mentioned. Sometimes, think, thinking particularly to that, that episode you, yeah. you, you talked about, sometimes the presidents seem like they're um, trying to position themselves ahead of some of these meetings when I don't know that that information is as valuable or, or can be very confusing, um, particularly if I sense that they're trying to move markets because they fear the Fed won't move, um, uh, you know, unless there's at least a decent probability within financial markets that they'll move. And so there's some of that that I, I sense going on or I feel going on among the back presidents, and that I, I don't find helpful. That, I think, is the dynamic that John was talking about, right, that now, you know. And I'm wondering, do you think that your, your legitimate collegiality or this idea that you really are welcome dissent, welcome differing opinions, has unleashed that at all? Sort of letting the bank presidents use, you know, speeches to try to influence the FOMC in a way that maybe is not as helpful or? Well, I, I don't, I, I think that, uh, as, as John was saying, I think that uh, there ought to be, um, the first thing that, that preserving presidents and governors ought to do is try to explain the, the consensus view and, and, and then make arguments. I don't think it's very constructive to be predicting what the, com the committee is going to do at the next meeting, that kind of thing, which is kind of the thing that the markets want to hear. Yeah. But I think it is constructive for, uh, and again, Governor Brainer's example, I think it is constructive to make broad arguments about the strategy of policy and what things the FOMC should be looking at. And, and one further comment. I mean. Uh, Alan and John talked about the distinction between individual and group accountability. It is true that the, 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 the mandate to the Fed is to the FOMC as a whole, but there is some individual accountability. In particular, the, the, for example, the, board, the governors are all individually appointed, Senate confirmed. Their, presumably their future careers internally or externally depend on whether they've been seen to be on the right side or on the wrong side. There is, at least in some sense, individual accountability. and, and um, 
it, that's, that's desirable to some extent because you want the uh, outside to understand that there are people with some weight who are carrying different positions and so that there's a range of views being represented, that there's not uh, strictly chair-dominated or single point of view dominated decision making. So um, I think there is actually some mix there of individual and group accountability. So let's talk about the dots a little bit more. Um, so, so one question, one of the things that you opened with actually is like a lot of the things that you did, you did because it was a, a very unusual time and basically you want to signal that the reaction function had changed and so you couldn't just look at past behavior. And so the dots have been criticized. Is, is this kind of the, the move towards transparency something that you can never retreat from? Like if you decide you know, the dots are no longer useful, do you think politically going and saying we're not publishing anymore is something that would be criticized and you're like, oh, the, the Fed doesn't want to be transparent anymore? Or is that something that actually should be on the table? I, I, US, well, there's always, so. a, there's always a bit of a sense that once you do something, it's hard to take it's it back. Take back but yeah. that being said, you know, if there is an element of a broad transparency initiative that is not working, and I'm not making that judgment, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just saying that if you make that decision, I don't see any reason why you couldn't, you couldn't you change it. We probably write a pretty bad story. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we're not going to stop plots. Oh, no, a bad story. <laughs> that's, oh, my God. Oh, no, we can't do it. That's right. <laughs> But that's bad part story, of our bad role. Press. Not saying it would prevent you, <laughs> but also it would provide definitely fodder for the media yes. as well. I mean, I, you know, I also I also think that uh, the dot plots legitimately can be confusing. But I also think, kind of going back to my original point, is that you know we all wouldn't be sitting here sort of scratching our chins about what do the dot plots actually mean if the forecasts that had been made turned out to be correct, right? If the Fed had hiked four times, as sort of the dot plots had suggested over the course of 2016, right? Then we say, oh, right, that's the, the Fed thought they were going to hike four times, and then they did. So I think it also goes back to a more fundamental question about uncertainty, accuracy of forecasts, and, you know, what is, again, for the press, what is the level of accountability we should hold policymakers to? Yeah, but I think that goes back to this question, which is, you know, how much can the Fed really communicate about what it will do when, when situations change, right? I mean, so you can hold them accountable, but they're very clear. Like, it depends on what happens with the economy, what happens to Brexit, what happens, you know, all kinds of things. So, so I guess, in, in a way, the dot plots are trying, trying to show the reaction function. And so if we're not going to get rid of them, um, what do you think of the idea of, of actually, you don't have to do it by name, but linking the economic forecast sort of by number, let's say, with the policy rate forecast. Do you think that would help? Um, we'll start. I would like that. Uh -huh. um, but, but then again, I'm thinking of it in terms, I, I like the video game analogy. You know, that's, yeah. you know, some of us would like information that's at an advanced level, whereas other information um, needs to be at a different level. And trying to you know, synthesize, I think, that range of audiences into a, a consistent communication message is, is a challenge. But I, I think that would be helpful information. And, Understanding that there's a lot of different forecasts that are attached to these different, um, uh, you know, interest rate forecasts. I mean, is there a worry that having this range of information is not just like, oh, I know I'm supposed to look at this one, and somebody else is supposed to look at the more complicated one, but that it can confuse? Like having too much out there for the for the one who's not on level 12, you know, will just actually make the communications worse for them, or? Well, you know, it just depends on how our, it's just there's different audiences and different receptors, and, you know, I think that those um, different audiences should be, you know, attuned to the fact that you know, they, in fact, might have different audiences themselves and be able to help interpret some of this information, you know, a, a, across different, different types of viewpoints. Okay, so we have a minute. So what I'm going to ask each of you is a sort of a two questions, which is, one, what, if you had to, to ask the Fed to make one change, what would it be? And two, how important do you think that is the communications issue? Like, are they pretty good, and so that's not really what they should be worrying about, or is it really important, you know, particularly, particularly in this political context, that they really, you know, work on improving communications? So I'm going to go this way. I'll start with you, Lynn. Uh, more one. governor and, uh, you know, chair speeches. That's what I would really emphasize. Is I think that's where you have the central point of policymaking uh, in, in Constitution Avenue, and I think you need to focus more effort on that. Uh, more press conference after every meeting, um, and of course, I'm biased, right? Um, but I would also say, um, in terms of um, uh, in terms of what the Fed um, 
the second part of your question was what the Fed could do. How is important communications right, oh, yes. right now? It, like, it, it's, it... it's important because in the in moving one time per year, the Fed isn't doing much else other than talking, right? So I think it becomes really important that they, that they talk well. Or they're <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Ben? I, I don't have specific recommendations other than uh -huh. to say that, that maybe it should be worth emphasizing that sort of the premise of this whole thing is that most of the changes have been in the right direction. You know, that we, mm -hmm. nobody here is talking, well, we should go back to 1994 and have no statement and, and, and none of this other stuff. And, and it's a complex world and it's a complex, large, you know, diverse committee. And, you know, we've, we took steps. Some of them have been more successful than others probably, but I think the general direction is one that people seem to be supportive of. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have time for some questions from the audience. Please uh, say who you are. Um, back there, and I'm in the back. Uh, hi, uh, Howard Schneider from Reuters. I just uh, think broadly one thing uh, that sort of hasn't been addressed here is that we're all speaking as if uh, the current uh, lay of the land is going to remain the lay of the land. And, uh, you know, we may reach a position in, in six months where Fed communications has to include, for example, a monetary policy rule. So uh, this is very backward looking, and I'm wondering what you think the risks are if suddenly Fed communications are constrained by uh, congressional or White House stipulation. Yes, <laughs> that, that could happen, and, and you know, I've certainly been very concerned that that you know that, that how we operate monetary policy going forward could dramatically change uh, over the next four years. In the case of monetary policy rule, I mean, this discussion shows you how the practical issues, you know, so for example, even a Taylor rule, which ignores so many things that you want to take into account when doing monetary policy, depends on a committee consensus on the natural rate of unemployment or the potential output. It depends on a committee consensus on the, on the equilibrium interest rate. And what, this, what, the, what the dot plot shows you is that there's a lot of divergence in the committee about these fundamental parameters, although as I pointed out in my post, I think it gives you information about them, but the idea that you could create a rule that would involve a uh, committee agreement on our star and that that would be a good idea strikes me as, as, as problematic. So I think that this debate just shows the practical difficulties of some of the, some of the proposals, but we'll see how, how it evolves. You know, I, uh, aspirational legislation and actual legislation are sometimes not the same thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Regina Schlager from Medley Global Advisors. I wonder if um, the former chair could talk a little bit about the role of the um, subcommittee for communications and how that may intersect with some of the issues you're talking about. What role do they play in... Um, finessing, enhancing some of the communications tools that, uh, that the Fed finally settles upon? Well, the, the, there's been a more or less ongoing subcommittee of communications with the FOMC going back um, before, before my chairmanship. It goes back into uh, Chairman Greenspan. And it's been typically um, chaired, that subcommittee has typically been chaired by the, the vice chair of the board. So, uh, uh, Ferguson, uh, Cohn, Yellen were the, were the chairs of that, and it would typically be four or five people, including uh, both governors and reserve bank presidents. And, and that subcommittee has brought ideas to the, to the FOMC, and, and, and a lot of the things that you see came out of very extensive debates. Uh, I remember uh, uh, one governor saying, you know, that she was, she was willing to sign on to any of the new ideas as long as we could just stop talking about them. For <laughs> so um, they've been, it's, been a, it's been a very useful, it's been very useful and, and, and I can assure you at least one thing, and the transcripts will reveal this, that the, that the FOMC has put enormous, I mean, hours and hours and hours into trying to debate these, these various uh, uh, strategies. Um, and there's a kind of a meta problem, which is that the communication rules themselves have to be decreed upon by, <laughs> by the committee. So, uh, but the, the subcommittees have, have pretty much ongoing. I assume it still exists, and uh, Jay is nodding yes, yeah. and uh, continues to be a source of debate and, and bringing people on board to some extent of, of the strategies that the committee uses. Yep, oh, here we go. <laughs> Here's a mic's coming.
So I, I guess, uh, uh, sorry, Seamus Brown, more capital. Uh, interrelated uh, observation or question, which is, you know, the, the read on the election uh, driving the, the November decision sort of reminds me that the market tends to interpret the FOMC dishonestly. You know, as in there's always a conspiracy theory that explains behavior better than some sort of fundamental explanation, um, which is a bit of a disservice. And that may be a function of this, this sort of video game level 12 issue as it relates to communication, that it's, you know, it's essentially the domain of PhDs to understand what the, the Fed's up to. So, you know, the Chairman Bernanke did this while he was running the Fed, you know, sort of doing outreach, getting on 60 Minutes, doing a better job explaining the economics underlying monetary policy. Uh, I wonder if, you know, to what extent can the Fed improve communications to overcome this, this cynical view or cynical interpretation of the motivations of monetary policy, and whether or not that has something to do with sort of bringing it down to a more basic level so that people understand what it is the model for the economy, what people are doing, and, and, and what's dictating the outlook for monetary policy. I'd just like to point out that QE2, which was a highly controversial policy, was, enact, was, was, cho was enacted by the committee on election day in, in 2010. Mm -hmm. So it isn't completely allergic to those factors. I mean, the, the, the committee, to some extent, has to be, well, will in practice at least be somewhat less than fully transparent because of the internal deliberations, because you have to try to come up with a consensus and people have different views. Um, but I have a think it's I think it's in the nature of central banks that you're going to get conspiracy theories no matter what no matter what you do. Yeah, that's I, I think it's real, very hard to eliminate that conspiracy theory element. It's a very loud, um, vocal minority within the um, uh, financial press and the market community. But but getting rid of it has just been, you know, virtually impossible. No matter how much communication we do. Leonard Campbell. Um, I was at an event yesterday where I spent about four hours listening to members of the press and academia uh, essentially say that the public had gotten the election wrong. Essentially, they had voted for the wrong candidate. Um, and as I listened to you talk, I, I wonder if there's something that the press or the Fed could have done to communicate uh, to the public that the economy was a little better, essentially assuming that the, the outcome of the election was a, a referendum on the state of the economy. I mean, I, I think this, the question is also relates to the, the difficulty of communication when you want to be careful, you know, about how your statements can be interpreted and not to sort of be causing, you know, oh, things are worse than they seem and to be causing people to sort of interpret the economy. And I don't, and so I'm going to bring that to that, like, to what extent do you have to worry that the signal you're getting will sort of be self-fulfilling? Like, if you say, oh, the economy's worse, then it will actually become worse than it seems. Um, well, Sherry Ellen was asked in her testimony about the implications of possible policies under the new administration and her position, which I think is reasonable, is we don't know what, we don't have a lot of clarity about what those policies are going to be. Um, and so it would be a little bit ir irresponsible to, <laughs> given how hard it is to forecast in the first place, if you don't know exactly what the policy changes are going to be, how are you going to, how are you going to forecast the outcomes? So this, this goes back yeah. to, to the point that you made, which is there's an inconsistency there. The Fed specifically called out Brexit as a risk that uh, that led to its decision not to hike in June. They said, you know, we can wait more, one more week, we'll know the outcome, then we can make a decision once we have more information, right? Um, whereas with the US election, which is happening, you know, right here in our own country, uh, they did not, they did not, uh, they did not acknowledge the same uncertainty surrounding, surrounding the vote. So I think that, you know, either one, you don't mention Brexit, Right or two, you mentioned Brexit and you mentioned the November election, but to do one and not the other seemed to me to be inconsistent. The, the word Brexit was not in any statement, as far as I'm aware. No. It, she said it in her uh, post meeting press conference. The, the other thing about Brexit was that the economic analysis was pretty clear, which was that there was a strong view that if Brexit unexpectedly passed, that there would be a big negative market reaction, which was true in the short run. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew what 
I mean, nobody, nobody could make the same kind of statement about the election. Obviously, we saw what happened. <laughs> right. 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 So <laughs> the night before, the day after. Right. I mean, it's, it's not obvious. Well, the, point was that, the point, the point is not saying. The, but the point was not to take a stand on, you know, one way or the other. The economy will do better or do worse. The point is that there's uncertainty at this point in time, which will be resolved in one week. Right. Same but it's as, not. Same as it's not. Spike, I mean, we, 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 oh. it's been a month since <laughs> the election or whatever, and and. Uh, you have more, there's still a lot of uncertainty about policy and the economy, certainly. Well, it's been six months since Brexit, and we're still unclear what exactly that's going to look like as well. Louise, can I ask you? Yeah. So uh, somebody mentioned that forward guidance was an innovation during the crisis for obvious reasons. You had to convey to the markets that rates wouldn't go up as quickly as they had anticipated. That seems to me something that may have to be put back into the bottle. Do you think that's possible? Or if people come weaned on, how do you wean them off this notion that the Fed is going to tell you where they think they're going? Well, as I said before, I think in normal times that, that setting your targets and your forecasts might be enough. And the, um, uh, the, the summary of economic projections is not forward guidance. It is a survey of the, of the forecast and the views of the, of the um, uh, individual participants in the FOMC. It is most explicitly not a promise or, or even a conditional promise by the committee about what it plans to do. That's very important. That's, that's the first thing in my list of things that it is not, is that it is not a commitment. It is not forward guidance. All right, Ben, you get the last word. So thank you all.